Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone. My name is Bree Noble. I am so excited to be here with you on the podcast and with our guest, Tammy Johnston from KSA Business. We're going to be talking all about musicians and business like we always do, but we're going to weave in a little bit interest, something interesting today. We're going to talk about um, being ethical and moral in our business. And um, it's something that I strive to do, but sometimes things are a little gray area, you know, so it'll, it'll be really good to talk this out. Um, so let's just start out by finding more out about Tammy. Tammy, let us know a little bit about your background, um, you know, how you ended up coaching business owners, and working with musicians specifically? So I'm Tammy Johnston, and my business is KSA Business. I'm actually known as the hold your hand and kick your ass business coach. Oh, I was going to mention that. I love (laughs) that tagline. That's fabulous. That's actually what my um, my clients named me that because they said, you love us and you support us, but you don't let us get away with nothing. (laughs) I love it. And so actually my background is financial services. So I've been doing that for coming up on 33 years and I worked in various companies and stuff. And then um, about 23 years ago, I had that magical turning moment and finally decided to start my business and went into sales. And one of the things that I was discovering is I was working with a lot of self-employed people, small business owners and that artists. And they desperately needed help with their business stuff. And I'm going, well, that's my talent. That's my background. That's my passion. So I started helping them with their business because I'm going, if I can get them making more money or making money, period, that works for me because I found that broke people can't afford investments or insurance, which is the stuff I actually got paid on. And so I started helping them and then they started sending me more and more of their colleagues and that. So then I had to start teaching my small business class. So I've been coaching small business owners for over 20 years now. And then in 2019, I split my business into two. So I still have my personal financial planning company. And then I have KSA where I focus on teaching, coaching, consulting people to build sustainable, successful businesses. That's awesome. So do you mostly work with solopreneurs? Most are, yeah. Most of the ones that I work with are solopreneurs. Because my sweet spot, I like getting them as early in the process as possible. Like idea stage up to two years is where I can have the most positive impact. Hmm. So yes, most start off as solopreneurs, but I've had quite a few go on to expand and do wonderful things and we still work with them. But my sweet spot is, like you said, idea stage up to two years. Got it. And where are you located? I am in British Columbia, Canada. How did I know you were Canadian? I, I yeah, love the so, Canadian yeah. accent. Fully pasty white Canadian shit. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I have tons of people that listen to the podcast and are in my community that are from Canada. So in fact, our community manager lives in Canada. So Oh, well, we are wonderful. Yes, I agree. <laughs> I, everybody that I know from Canada is amazing. Um, do you find that the, it's any different, like training people to run a business in Canada versus the U.S.? No, doesn't matter where they are. Business is business is business. Some of the legal stuff changes on how you have to do things. Some of the requirements for how you do your accounting changes. But business, it doesn't matter where you are. The foundational pieces are all exactly the same. And then It's just how exactly do you put it together for your particular business? But I've worked with tradespeople, medical people, tons of artists. I've worked with retail. I've worked with like the gamut. And one of the things that I love about that is, yes, you see that business is business is business, but also the cross pollination of ideas. And I've had like my musician clients learn from like my massage therapist clients and my truck driver clients and everybody because. 
there's definitely advantages to hanging out with people that are doing the same or very similar things to you. You get to learn very technical stuff and very, but you don't get the cross pollination of ideas when everybody's in this, in the same silo. I think that's definitely true. Um, so you have to kind of have, I try to have a balance of people that are doing something similar to me. And then like being in groups of people that are doing something quite different, mm -hmm. because like you said, it, it's something that you never would have thought of might come up and then you can apply it. That's another thing I enjoy doing is like taking things that I've learned somewhere else and applying it to musicians. Mm -hmm. Like not a lot of other people are, are applying to musicians. That's super fun. Yeah. Exactly. That's cool. So how did you end up kind of attracting musicians and what did you find were like kind of their unique issues when they came to you that they needed help with at first? Well, how I started getting them is I actually started getting a few being referred by other business clients who are going, I've got, I've got, my nephew is really big into this and I know like he's super talented, like really, really good, but he needs help on the business side. Can you help him with that? So I would start talking. And then he would send me other people. And then I've, like I said, I've got professional comedians. I have Olympic athletes for clients and they, okay, can you help my friend? Yes. With the basics. As long as you don't ask me that, like, I see your beautiful guitar in the background. Don't ask me to play it. I know nothing, <laughs> but on the business side, I can help you. Your job is to play the guitar. <laughs> And I'm sure they love hearing that because most of them are like, all I want to do is play guitar and sing and write songs. And I don't want to have to deal with this business stuff, but I know I have to. Exactly. I don't know. Everybody starts off as a technician. Doesn't matter what the, I want to be like my electrician. I want to be on the tools. What I don't want to deal with invoicing and marketing and all. Well, guess what? If you want to be self-employed, you want to be running your own show. Guess what? You have to learn to do that stuff. But you can get better at it. You can get it systematized. Then you can bring in help. But if you don't want to be having a job where somebody else is looking after all of that, guess what? It lands on your shoulders. Yep, definitely. And are, do most people come to you when they're like doing music on the side or maybe they just got out of college and they want to do music, but they have to have some other job to pay the bills? Or are these like full-time people already? Most are actually when they're kind of transitioning. And they're, they, they do have a day job because making it in the arts, whether it be the comedian or the musician or, or the painter or whatever they are, it is hard to start off and get making money. And then they actually start hating the art because they're going, I have to work so hard to sell it. If I don't sell it and I have to do these commissions that I don't want to do and all of this stuff, that they actually start to not like their jobs. I'm going, I really like it when I can get them when they do have a day job and it's like, okay, let's build something on the side. Cause if you've got the day job, that's making sure that the mortgage is paid or the rent's paid and food's on the table, then you can do your music or your art or whatever it is for fun and joy. And then it's an awful lot easier to sell it and market it because you don't have that, that desperation, that panic behind you that everyone can smell from like a thousand kilometers away. Oh my gosh, you're speaking my language. I say that exact same thing, especially around bookings. It's like, it's like no one is going to want to book you when they can tell that if they don't book you, you're not going to be able to pay your rent. Mm -hmm. And or they'll book you and they'll take advantage of you. Uh -huh. they, know, they know that you need it. Well, you're going to give me more and I'm going to negotiate your fees down. And especially when I've worked with a lot of the musicians, they're they are getting paid, but it's not even enough to cover their costs in a lot of the time. So if that's what you're doing to be paying your bills, that is like a lose-lose situation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I'm glad you said that because I've said that many times that, that it's just like when someone is is trying to get a job and you're interviewing them, you can tell, the, like even with their body language and stuff, like that they need that job and it mm -hmm. makes them less desirable. It's It's just like when you're dating somebody and, you know. They, they like really want you like you kind of want to say I don't want them because you want to play hard to get or whatever but you well know, if somebody's coming human... on too strong you're going yes. okay what what are your issues <laughs> 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 what stuff is going on in the background that I am not going to want to find out about but one of the like so I told you my background is financial services let me explain that to you I sell life insurance if you want to clear a room go into the room and say <laughs> I sell life insurance and everybody is going to be running for the hills. Nobody wants to talk to you. So 
if you go in, I okay, I need to make this sale in order to like pay my bills. That makes you even more repulsive. So you have to find way. Like I said, learn. Like I sell stuff that absolutely nobody wants. People need, but they don't want it. <laughs> so That's learning funny. how to do that because it's a very good thing. Yeah, it just doesn't sound exciting. It's like it's like me trying to you know get people excited about learning bookkeeping. Um, yeah. They kind of need to do it, but it's like, oh, that's like fingernails down a chalkboard for a lot of artists. Oh, yes. Can I go clean the toilet? Um, can 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 I like what can I do other than that? <laughs> <laughs> so when musicians come to you, like, what do you find? Like, what do you work with them on at first? Like, what do they really need help with at first? Usually when I'm dealing with musician and other like artistic types and stuff like that is getting them to understand that if they do want to be making money at this, that it is a business. Because so many of them have this, I just need to get on to like American Idol or mm -hmm. I'll have my magic moment where I'll get found. That's everybody's dream and all of it. Like if I could just get this one thing and magically everything opens up. No. And even the ones that we see, like we've heard it over and over and over again. Overnight successes take 10 to 20 years yeah. because they're putting in the work. They're doing this stuff. They're playing to the, the, the tiny little crowds and, and they're they're busting their butt, not making the money, but they're doing the work day in and day out, and day in and day out before they hit their big magical moment. There are ways that you can have it come faster. There's ways you can have it come easier. But if you think you just have to be the most talented musician, you are not going to make it. No, like you have to look at it as a business and you have to be running it as a business. Yeah, I mean, I wish it were true that like everybody was valued based upon their talent and it, but it it just isn't true. Like you have to know how to promote yourself. You have to know how to manage money, you, you know, all the things that that go along with it. Mm -hmm. Do you find that they are like resistant to that idea? And have you had clients like just walk away like I, I can't I'm not going to do this. I'm I'm convinced I'm just going to have my my viral moment on TikTok and uh, then I'm going to be all good. So I don't want to do this business stuff. There's all, there's always, there's always a few, but most are real. Like typically if they get to the point where they're talking to me at all, they're starting to realize things like people typically, like I said, especially on the artistic side, don't come to me right off the bat. They have to go through some pain first. They have to collect some bruises and some scrapes and things like that. And they're going, okay, maybe there are some things that I need to learn about this other than like how to just play my instrument or sing and things like that. So they're a lot more open to it. And then I find by asking them a few questions and like I said, getting into the conversation and stuff, they start warming up to it because they think it has to be scary and that's boring and it's, it's I'm going to have to sell my soul and stuff like that. But when they actually start learning about it, they're going, oh, no, okay, this does make sense. So most are pretty open to it because, like you said, the majority of people are coming to me after they've already collected a few bruises and scrapes and they're going, this hurts. Can I make it better? Yeah, it's true. I mean, I remember, you know, uh, in a band I was in, thinking that, like, this one show was going to be it for us. Like, if we did this one show, then, like, people were going to see us and we were suddenly going to, you know, move forward leaps and bounds and didn't happen like that. In fact, the band broke up right afterward. Yep. So, you know, like you go through a few things like that and then you're like brought back down to reality of like it's actually like building blocks. Like it's just like any other business has to build themselves. Yep. Even though you're not getting those messages out there as a musician, you're getting the, you know, do this talent search, do this, you know, and that, that'll that'll but make you want to know something. That bullshit message is not just for musicians. I have seen it across everybody. It's like, there's so many people, I just need to hang out my sign and it will come, build it and okay. they will come. That is the biggest line of bullshit ever. <laughs> I didn't realize like non-musicians thought that way. Oh, they go, yeah, there's so many, like when I'm working with my re retail clients and stuff, that's one of the biggest things. They just need to have like a good location and put mm. up a great sign and that's all that they need to do. And and they'll they'll work on being... Like the inside, everything needs to be perfect and stuff like that. But I don't need to go out and market because I've got a sign. Oh. And all like there's that is normal. That is standard. There's because we are not taught the realities 
of business or marketing and sales and how do we put together our systems and stuff like this. We are taught, how do you do this one skill? And people believe that's, a, that's all you need because that's what we have been pushed through our education system, through employment. You have this one skill and that's all you need. Both. Call it out. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> It's true. It's just like online. People think, well, once I get my website built, like that will be the magic portal that, you know, everybody will now find me. Yes. On page 14,003 right. on Google, oh, Google, because how many websites are out there? And then you've got, then you're dealing with all the, the spam bots and the stuff that show it like it is a piece, but I have yet to find a magic bullet. They don't exist. Yeah, no, I mean, I I really, I like to say that business is hard because I don't want people to think that it's just easy. Like it, it is hard, but you know, there are ways that will work better for you than others and finding what those are and work best with your personality and the way you work and stuff like that is what's going to be able to- I, I don't like saying business is hard mm. because that, that scares off a lot of people. Business is effort. Business- Okay, that's good. Distant effort. Because here's one of the like, yes, I do work hard. I work a lot of hours. Of, but here's the thing. I love what I do and I enjoy doing it. Not everything. Like there's paperwork and carp and I'm like, oh crap, do I have to deal with this again? But that's just part mm -hmm. of it. But it is, it is consistent and, and I do what I want to do and I work with people that I want to do. Musicians get to play the music that they want to, and how do they want to do it? But you have to be putting in that consistent effort over time. I like that effort. Effort is a better word. I think when I'm just giving tough love to like my community members, I'm like, look, every everything that you're gonna do is hard. It's just you you got to pick the one that's gonna be the most fitting for you. And I full I fully agree, but I'm very I'm very picky when it comes to the language. I like it. Is how how we frame things. So I like, for example, I was talking with my mom this morning and she, going, oh, well, I went, she's part of uh, a health group. And so she says, well, I lost some weight. And going, no, you didn't lose weight. We, when we say we lost something, that's something we want back. No, we released it. Mm -hmm. Is it hard? No, it's consistent effort. It, framing it makes it an awful lot easier for people to go, okay, yes, this is something I can do. It is something that, I'm not going to enjoy every moment, but it is something that I can achieve and it is something that is worthwhile. Mm, I like that. I definitely like that. I'm going to use that. Um, what about income streams? Like, do you encourage them to like go out and get a bunch of different income streams? Like, how do you felt help them decide like which things they should pursue? Because there really are a lot of income streams musicians can pursue. Oh, there, there's tons of them. So a lot of it comes down like having the conversations and going, um, what do you want to do? And yes, I'm a huge fan of multiple income streams. But the big thing is so many people, yes, I need multiple income streams. So they're trying to do 12 things at right. once. Yes. I'm going, you pick one to start with mm -hmm. and you do it and you get good at it and you get it systematized and put together. Then you can add another one and then you can add another one. But if you're trying, if you're, if you're, if you're trying to operate like a shotgun, spray and pray, you're not going to succeed because you're running around and you're spinning plates and your, your energies are all over the place and you can't, we can only do so much at once. So pick one thing and let's get that set up and then you can add more and let's figure out, okay, what is something that based on your skills, based on your connections, based on where you are, what is the most likely thing for you to start with? Hmm. Yeah, no, I know you just you do that whole like spray and play pray and the whole pl spinning plates and you just end up burning out. And then you like you said earlier, you just end up hating music. Yes. And you'd go work in an office because you're just and you end up hating that, too. <laughs> yeah, you hate that, too. And then you hate everything. And yeah, I know it's not good. And then you don't want to. I always think about it in like, I don't want to shut musicians down because they are creating like art and if you if they stop doing it like there is art that will not be will not exist because of that and and, and our world out. needs the art like thinking back to the pandemic when the entire world was shut down what kept people sane and going forward being able to listen to their music being able to watch their shows and read their books that's all art mm -hmm. but if the artists the musicians 
didn't have it set up so that it could get out to the world, didn't have the the business sense, the business support, nobody would have ever heard about it. Yeah. And, and, you know, I always also say like, you know, you, you need to know this so you can keep making music because for yourself and for your fans, yeah. right? Because if you can't finance what you're doing, eventually you're going to go broke. You're going to go in debt. You're going to, you know, or you're just going to stop because it is expensive to be a musician. Yeah. Is it an expensive hobby or is it a potential or is it an income stream? Right. And that's for everybody. <laughs> yep. So I want to talk about, you mentioned that you really uh, focus on kind of making sure that we are doing business in an ethical and moral way. How do you talk to your clients about that? Well, I always say my rules for business are honest, moral, and ethical because they're unfortunately, especially in our modern world, in the, in the corporate sense, they lie, they cheat, they buy the laws that they want, and it is a race to the bottom. It is making our society worse. It is making everything worse, where the small business owners, in order to stay in business, our, re our reputation is everything. If you're going to lie, you're going to rip people off, you're going to cheat, you do any that's going to get out. And then nobody's going to want to deal with you because who wants to deal with ones like that? Like, we hear we hear the stories talking about musicians and stuff like that. And oh, okay, I went to a concert. I remember going to Gun, a Guns N' Roses concert like probably 30 years ago. And I was so excited about it. And they didn't come out onto the stage until almost two hours after they were supposed to start. And they could get away with that because they're the big stars and stuff. But I'm going, I lost an awful lot of respect for them in that moment. And if you're going... If you are a just starting out musician and you try to pull a stunt like that, it's not honest. It's not ethical. You've pissed off everybody. So how is that helping anyone? When you treat people with respect, you live up to the agreements that you have made. If you only make agreements that are fair and honest and ethical, you might lose out on some short-term money, some short-term gigs. but. It pays off in the future over and over and over again because you are building up that relationship that, yes, your music is good, but yes, they're also going to show up on time. They're not going to wreck the place. They're not going to be jerks. We're not going to have uh, drugs everywhere because that's what they're promoting and stuff. Like, who would you choose if, if you're a concert promoter or you want them to come in and play it? play at your event and stuff. Well, I've got somebody, yeah, they're really talented, but are they going to show up and what type of stuff are they going to do? And are they going to be miserable? And is the, is the green room going to be destroyed afterwards or somebody? Yes, they're very talented too, but they're going to show up on time. They're going to be respectful. They're going to do what they say they're going to do. Who are you going to hire? Yeah, no, absolutely. And in music, you see a lot of situations where this happens internally too, like with between band members between, uh, you know, co-writers, between a uh, producer and a uh, performer, or even like between manager and artist. Have you experienced any of that? Yes. <laughs> and this is, I've also been called in like when they're having those problems and stuff and they're going, okay, how do I, how do I deal with this? How do I get out of it? Well, I always say the best thing is not to get into the mess in the first place. <laughs> Not to get in the mess in the first place. Like just because somebody's offering you something doesn't mean you sign papers. And if you don't understand the legalese, find somebody who can. And going, are you fully aware of what you're signing on for? And if you've already signed in and you've got a relationship, okay, what are your escape clauses? How do you how do you get out of it? If it is a bad fit, if somebody's lying to you, somebody's cheating, somebody's stealing from you, which happens a lot in the arts, because like, hey, who owns your copyright? This is why the business stuff is important. You don't have to know everything, but if you don't know the basics so that you know what questions to ask so that you can bring in the experts that can help you and cover your butt, how much could you possibly lose? Like, how long was Kesha not able to perform and do all of that stuff because of the bullshit with her contracts? Right. Why did Prince change his name? Bullshit with contracts. Yeah. So do you do you usually recommend that they bring a lawyer in to read any kind of contract? Well, 
It depends on the complexity of the contract, but I'm going, well, number one, always read it yourself. Cause even if you are having an expert look over it, like I, I remember, so um, Malcolm Jamal Warner, do you remember who he is? Uh, yes. Oh, 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 uh, Theo. Yeah. He played Theo on, on the Cosby show. And one of the best lessons and I, for artists and all of this stuff, he always said, like his mom, because he started at the show fairly young and he was making good money because it was like the most popular show out in the 80s yep. for years. Must and he was TV. Making, yep, I remember. Making good money. And he says, I hate it at the moment, but I absolutely, like it was one of those valuable things ever. His mom used to take him to the meetings with his like accountant and his legal team and all that stuff every quarter <laughs> so that, and make him ask questions and like, figuratively smack him around a little bit to make sure that he was paying attention so that he understood that what was going on and that his money was being looked after properly because there's so many of these people that make they had that magic moment and they made lots of money but they didn't learn anything at all about it or the contracts and they ended up getting screwed his mom made sure that he knew and understood and he says, I'm set for life. I don't like if I don't want to do a job or anything like that, I don't financially have to because I learned this stuff because my mother forced me. Mm. So learning to read that and then, yes, at least have somebody else take a look over it. Like when you're when you're looking at relatively small stuff, like do you have to have a lawyer on speed dial? No, but you do need to learn the stuff. And if you have questions or anything at all like that, there are ways that you can be talking to lawyers for a lot less than you think. A lot of people avoid them because they're going, oh, my God, I, I don't have the money. That's just so expensive. Well, you either pay a couple hundred bucks now or it could cost you hundreds of thousands later. Yep. Yeah, I know. I just watched that uh, the documentary about the Backstreet Boys and NSYNC and all that stuff. And it's like they didn't even look at it. They just no, signed it. They were just they were so excited. Oh, this is my magic moment. Everything's not no <laughs> the people that wrote up those contracts i guarantee they made sure that it was in their best interest mm -hmm. not yours yikes yeah i know that stuff is crazy so is there anything any other advice that you would want to give artists that's kind of come up with you working with all kinds of artists oh there's so many dear how much time do i have <laughs> Okay, if I had to pick one thing, like I'm going, it is like I said, is it a uh, an expensive hobby? Because if that's what you don't, all the power to you, all the power to you. But if you actually want this to be something that is going to make you money, that could be your livelihood, it is a business. And if you want to succeed, you need to learn the business skills. You need to have good people in your corner that can help you out. So that the majority of your time and energy can go into your passion of making the music. But if you are not going to treat it like a business, don't delude yourself. Mm. What is your opinion about like going to school for music business? Do you think that that they can actually learn what they need to learn to be in the real world in a in like a college program? In a college program, I've yet to find one that. Cut. like they'll definitely teach you pieces but like i said i've been teaching small business for over just over 20 years now and i've actually had people that have gone through the business courses and all of that stuff and then they've come and done my course and they said i learned more in your weekend than i did in four years of college or whatever and it's not saying they didn't learn stuff in college but it was much more on the macro level where the mm -hmm. stuff that i'm like how do, like how do you put your day together what are the questions you ask much more on the ground stuff like i'm all for learning like there's great books you can get great podcasts like this one and other ones that you can listen to to learn different skills but you still need somebody else in your like having a great business coach is one of the best things you can do for your business yeah do i they know what they're talking about do they care about you and are they the type of coach you need for what you need now yeah, I agree. I, I've had different coaches at different times in my business that I needed for that particular kind of season of my business or what I was focusing on. So that's a good point. Like finding the person that can help you with the thing that you're working on the most 
or or like if they're coming in and they're more at the beginning, you know, just getting those foundations that you're helping with. Yeah. And I say like when when you're first starting out, the newer you are, the more of a generalist you need. Like I work I know a lot of amazing business coaches, but they're specialists. I call them they're theologists. Hmm. And when you need the ologist, they're the best thing in the world. But if you need a generalist, you're going to go to this ologist and they're going to teach you great stuff, but it's not appropriate for you. You're not ready for it or it's not what you need at this moment. And then you're going to go to another ologist that's going to be the same thing. Great stuff, but not right for you. And you could spend all of your money on ologists and not get anything that you need because yeah. you, needed this, you needed a generalist to start off with. <laughs> I like that. No, yeah. And then you just end up feeling overwhelmed and be like, I, I can't handle this. It's too much. It's too complicated. Well, yeah. And I've put so much money out and I haven't gotten the results and stuff. I'm right. going like, if you're wanting to build a house, you don't have the living room interior decorated before your foundation's done, the roof's up and the walls are built. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. The foundation is so important uh, or we'll just, your whole house will fall down. Yeah, exactly. But there's so many people that are going, yes, that's a beautiful living room. And I want all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yes. In the right order. <laughs> yep. Yep. I agree. I, I always talk about the, uh, well, my framework is a musician's profit path and it's in stages. You, you go in stages. You cannot be in stage three when you start out. And the problem is you're looking at all these other artists that are at stage three going, how come I'm not where they are? And how can I get there? And how can I jump the line? You know, you can't jump the line. <laughs> I explained. So have you ever been to the Grand Canyon, Dirk? Yes. Yes. Everybody's seen the Grand Canyon because it's uh, movies and TV shows and all this stuff, but you don't grasp it until you actually go and see it. And I went and saw it. And I remember standing up at the top. And I think at the, the narrowest part of the Grand Canyon, it's like a mile and a half across. And I'm going, so many people are trying to jump over the Grand Canyon. You can't jump over the Grand Canyon. Doesn't happen. But you can waddle your ass from the, from the top of one rim down to the Colorado River and up the other side. That's the only way you're going to be able to do it. And it's an awful lot faster, safer. And here's the other thing, a lot more enjoyable because you're going to actually see things. Stop mm -hmm. trying to jump the Grand Canyon. Mm, I like that analogy. That's really good. I wanted to touch on one more thing that I heard you say that is really near and dear to me. And you said, you know, you kind of said, like, what does your day look like? Like the, the, the planning and time management aspect. I think that's where musicians really struggle because they've always had someone telling them what to do when. And especially if they just go full time, they're like, oh, I've got my whole day. What am I going to do? You know, and should I practice? Should I book? Should I do? You know, so how do you work with musicians around that? So. Number one, I've worked with them to figure, okay, what, it, what is your energy flow? So for example, I am not a morning person. <laughs> Don't talk to me in the morning. It is not going to happen. But I know where my energy flow is. And okay, what are the things that I need, need to be doing? Do I need to be practicing? Yes, you do. You need to be doing that for eight hours every day. No, you don't. But you need to be putting in your time. Do I need to be working on my bookings? Yes, absolutely. How are we fitting that in? Do I need to be looking at my financials? Yes. How do you, how do you fit it in? And then schedule it. Like one, one of the biggest challenges that for all small business people, self-employed solopreneurs, when they start, when you're in school, when you're an employee, you have external things telling you what to do, when, where, all of this stuff. When you're self-employed, you have to do that, which is, is freeing and terrifying at the same time when you're starting off because it's like, I can do whatever I want. I can do whatever I want. Um, <laughs> so what do you need to be doing? How are you fitting it into your day? Another one, how do you deal with all the distractions? Because when you start off, people say, oh, you're self-employed. You have control of your time. I can interrupt you for any reason. Can you run me errands? Can you pick me up and take me here? Can you do this? Can you do that? And next thing you know, you've lost six weeks and have accomplished nothing. Yep. Yep. It's really easy to do. Oh, so easy to do. And like I said, not just for musicians, for everybody. So it's like learning the hat. Like this is why I say foundation pieces. And one of them is, like I said, learning your habits so that you can succeed, so that you can be putting in that consistent effort, so that you can have those cumulative returns.
Yep. I absolutely agree. That's something that I definitely talk to artists about. So this has all been super helpful. I want to thank you for sharing today. And how can our listeners and the people that are watching find you online? So two places you can find me on my website. So ksabusiness.ca, because I'm a pasty white Canadian. And if you're asking, KSA stands for kick some ass. <laughs> Love it. And you can find me on Instagram at ksa.business. Those are the two best places to find me. Awesome. Well, guys, go connect with Tammy. Thank you so much, Tammy, for all of the wisdom that you gave everybody today. Well, thank you for having me, Brie. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.